हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन यूर वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा A major event is on in New Delhi. Prime Minister Modi attended today. The Dalai Lama will attend tomorrow. Needless to say, China is watching. We are talking about the Global Buddhist Summit and India's Buddhist diplomacy. Delegates from scores of countries are attending, and this has religious, diplomatic, and political dimensions. We'll discuss all of it. Also, a killer heat wave is sweeping through Asia. It's especially bad in India, hurting lives and livelihoods. This is not a weather story. It affects you directly. In the UK, people don't want to fund the king's coronation, and the government won't tell them how much it will cost. In Taiwan, the government wants people to learn English to boost the economy. In Latin America, there's a new challenge for the US. After years of coups and control, they face tough questions. All that and more is coming up. The headlines first. Explosions and gunfire rock Sudan's capital Khartoum as the second attempt at a ceasefire fails. Nearly 300 people have been killed in six days in the fighting between rival factions. After India overtakes China's population, Beijing downplays the numbers, saying quality is as important as quantity. Setback for Indian opposition leader Rahul Gandhi. A Gujarat court rejects his plea in the 2019 defamation case over Prime Minister Modi's surname. Gandhi had requested the court to stay his conviction. Today's ruling means the Congress leader cannot be reinstated as a member of Indian Parliament. Michael Schumacher's family is planning legal action against a German magazine. The magazine conducted an AI-generated interview with him. The former Formula One champion has not been seen in public since his ski accident in 2013. And K-pop star Moon Bin found dead at his home. The 25-year-old member of the boy band Astro is suspected to have died by suicide. Faith and diplomacy. You can't think of two things more further apart. One is rooted in culture and belief. The other is all about logic and hard calculations. Yet they have always intersected. India has been trying to perfect this powerful cocktail. How? By using its ancient ties with Buddhism. New Delhi is currently hosting a very important event, the Global Buddhist Summit. And the attendance is impressive. 30 foreign ambassadors, 171 foreign delegates, and 150 Indian Buddhist organizations. The idea is not just to showcase the values of Buddhism because those are already common knowledge. The idea is to marry those values with present challenges, whether it's war and aggression, or sustainable growth, or technological progress. Prime Minister Narendra Modi delivered an address on the first day of the summit. He said. that buddha's teachings offer solutions to world problems listen to this aadhunik vishva ki aisi koi samasya nahi hai jiska samadhan saikdo varsh pehle buddha ke upadeshon mein hame prapt na hua ho aaj duniya jis yuddh aur ashanti se peedit hai Buddha ne sadiyon pehle iska samadhan diya tha Now this is a Buddhist gathering so the obvious question is where is the world's top Buddhist leader the Dalai Lama He is expected to attend day 2 of the summit that's tomorrow And rest assured China will blow a fuse In 2011 the Dalai Lama had addressed a similar gathering in New Delhi and Beijing was furious They cancelled border talks with India soon after so expect a similar tantrum tomorrow The Chinese are like the Grinch during Christmas. A, they won't attend the summit themselves, and B, they won't let the Dalai Lama attend it either. Not a single Chinese monk has come to New Delhi. You see, there are two battles playing out here. One is over the Dalai Lama and Tibet, and the second is over the larger Buddhist world. Who gets to lead and shape that world? India or China? That is the contest. Now, first, let me tell you. why this battle is important buddhism is the fourth largest religion in the world around 500 million people practice it countries like cambodia thailand bhutan sri lanka and laos are buddhist majority others like south korea and malaysia have a sizable buddhist population now notice where these countries are located 
Southeast and Eastern Asia, the same region that China wants to dominate. It tells you why a communist atheist regime like China suddenly loves Buddhism. The problem is, China's Buddhism is political. It's about narrative, not faith. It's linked to controlling and dominating the Tibetan population. Hence the problem with the Dalai Lama and by extension the problem with India. For Beijing, Buddhism is the means to an end. And that end is appointing its own successor to the Dalai Lama. What about India? For New Delhi, the Dalai Lama isn't just a religious leader, he's also a strategic leverage. In 2011, the Dalai Lama was invited to speak despite protests from China. Same in 2023, the Dalai Lama has been invited despite the expected blowback. India, and that's one part of India's calculations, but the second one is equally important. Yes, the Buddha was born in modern-day Nepal, but he lived most of his life in India. His first sermon was in India. His enlightenment, even his final days. And that's something New Delhi can capitalize on. Basically, brand itself as the cradle and home of Buddhism. How do you do that? By boosting religious tourism, exchanging scholars and students, investing in Buddhist organizations abroad. In a nutshell, do what China can't do. Generate goodwill. The government is already working in this direction. In 2016, the Buddhist Circuit Project was announced. It follows the path of the Buddha. Starts off in Lumbini, heads to Bodh Gaya and Bihar, then Sarnath, Kushinagar and so on. 21 states are covered in this circuit. It already has four international airports and two domestic ones. The next step, of course, is to market it, to make it known to the Buddhist world, to get millions of Buddhists to visit India, because nothing influences policies like people. Every day we bring you news of conflicts, economic, military and political. Why do they matter? Because they impact our lives. Also because they appear more dramatic and more urgent. Would you put a heat wave in the same category? Because we have. A deadly heat wave is silently killing lives and livelihoods. And impacting more people than we care to acknowledge. The numbers are scary. Almost half of India's workers work outdoors. They are at risk. The loss in GDP is monumental. Even Nepal and China are reporting temperatures above 40 degrees. People are dying. This is not a weather story anymore. It is hurting your health. It is hurting your body and the economy of your country. If you're watching us from Asia, you already know what I'm talking about. Look at this map. From India to Bangladesh, Thailand, even eastern China, they're all red. In most of these cases, temperatures are shooting above 40 degrees. Records are being broken and India is among the worst affected. Over 90% of India is experiencing a severe heat wave. And we are only in the month of April. The worst may be yet to come. But already people are dying because of the heat. Many cities are reporting record temperatures. This week, India's meteorological department issued a heat wave alert. Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand, Sikkim, Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, these states saw extreme heat. Prayagraj recorded the maximum temperature. Prayagraj is in India's Uttar Pradesh. It's the country's largest state. Earlier this week, it was reporting temperatures above 44 degrees Celsius. In some cities, schools have been closed. On Sunday, 11 people died in Maharashtra and scores needed medical help. Do you know what happened there? There was a government event. It was held outdoors. The attendees were sitting under the scorching sun and this led to dehydration, even death. It is so hot that staying outside may put your life at risk. But many Indians don't have a choice. Look at this statistic. Around 49% of Indian workers work outdoors. That translates to over 230 million workers. 23 crore people in India work outdoors. They have no choice but to suffer the scorching heat. And this could be dangerous. Experts have raised an alarm. Indians are extremely vulnerable to heat waves, they say. The soaring temperatures can lead to health risks and food shortages. According to one estimate, 90% of India's population could be at risk. That's more than 1 billion people. And they could be adversely affected by heat waves. This is not a recent trend, though. Heat waves have been taking lives in India for decades now. Again, I have some data. Since 1992, over 24,000 people have died in India. Extreme heat took these lives, 24,000. And it could be worse in the future. 
Extreme heat could impact every aspect of our lives. 90% of India's total area now lies in extreme heat danger zones. There will be loss of productivity. Extreme heat could lead to 15% decline in outdoor working capacity. It will reduce the quality of life. 480 million people are vulnerable. Even India's economic growth is under threat. By 2050, 2.8% of India's GDP could be lost because of the heat. So the impact will be on both lives and livelihoods. And India won't be the only country to suffer. The entire Asian region is at risk. Look at Thailand. Last week, the heat wave there turned brutal. Temperatures soared to 45 degrees. This is a new national heat record for Thailand. In Bangladesh, temperatures soared above 40 degrees. That was the temperature in Dhaka. Last Saturday was the hottest for Bangladesh in 58 years. In some areas, roads were melting. It was that hot. Even China is suffering. On Monday, 12 Chinese provinces made new records. They reported their highest temperatures for the month of April. Maximiliano Herrera is a weather historian and he's been tracking this heat wave and this is what he says. This, and I'm quoting, this is the worst April heat wave in Asian history. The worst ever. If the trend continues, more records could be broken. Our world faces numerous threats, unresolved conflicts, terrorism, pandemics, life-threatening dangerous shortages. It is time to add climate change to that list. Extreme heat is proving to be a silent killer. And we know world leaders disagree on most things. Perhaps they can agree on this one. Our world order is undergoing big changes and they're not necessarily for the better. Our world is becoming more dangerous. Two powers are in a race, the United States and China, and they're ramping up their weapon stockpiles. They're arming themselves with more dangerous weapons and more nuclear weapons. We are entering a new strategic era, one that will be defined by the great, this great power contest. The risk of conflict is higher than ever before. I'll show you how, and we'll start with China. The PLA is eyeing a new weapon, a drone. It will be used to snoop on rivals. The Chinese military is amassing all kinds of spying tools these days. First the balloons, then a base in the Antarctic, we told you about it yesterday, and now the drones. The Americans say they pose a threat. They ordered a secret military assessment. China's new drones will fly at supersonic speeds, they say, at least three times the speed of sound. The drones have more capabilities, including a cutting-edge surveillance system. This will relay real-time data. How can this help the PLA? Such capabilities can be the difference between victory and defeat in war. Using this data, the PLA's generals can make real-time decisions. They can order missile strikes and strike with precision. Reports say the PLA has already established a unit for this drone, the supersonic drone. It falls under their Eastern Theatre Command. And where will China deploy these supersonic drones? Taiwan is a clear target. These drones can help China target American warships around Taiwan, even the military bases in the region. So drones are a clear worry. But there's a bigger threat, and that is nuclear weapons. China wants more nukes and it wants them fast. Xi Jinping seems determined he wants to close the gap with America. So he has ordered an expansion plan. China has about 410 nuclear warheads today. By the end of this decade, this number could grow to 1,000 warheads. And by 2035, China could end up with 1,500 nukes. This will bring them close to America's stockpile. How many nuclear weapons does the U.S. have? In 2021, it had around 3,750 nuclear weapons, nuclear warheads. These include both active and inactive warheads. China wants to catch up for obvious reasons. It wants to use these nuclear weapons as deterrents to keep America away from Taiwan. And it's speeding up the production of these weapons. It is now building a new reactor in Fujian. This reactor will deliver plutonium. What's plutonium? A radioactive chemical used to make atom bombs. So China has conveyed its intentions. It has started a new nuclear race. And the US plans to not be left behind. It has plans to modernize its nuclear arsenal. Washington will spend $2 trillion on this, $2 trillion on nuclear weapons. This money will not be spent in one go. The US plans to spend $2 trillion over 30 years to completely upgrade their nuclear triad. What's a nuclear triad? It basically means the ability to launch nuclear strikes 
from land, sea and air. That's a triad. America can do all three. And now it is upgrading these weapons. It is responding to a two-front challenge. The threat from China and the threat from Russia. Because Russia too rem remains a player. Russia too is developing new nuclear systems. In February, Moscow refused to honor the START Treaty with the US. The START Treaty placed limits on nukes. It came into force in the 1990s. The US and Russia decided to cut back on their nukes after the fall of the Soviet Union. And also allow inspections on nuclear sites. That's what they agreed to. Those were some of the key commitments. But Russia has suspended its participation. So the world is now in a three-way arms race. The US, China and Russia. And this race is more dangerous than the Cold War era. There were just two major nuclear powers then. Now there are three. And this is alarming not just for these three countries, but for the rest of the world too. Because this could lead to a trickle-down effect. How would a country like India read the nuclear build-up in China? This is a threat to India too. If China can target America with nukes, it can do the same across the Himalayas. Speaking of a new strategic era, it's not just about military realignment, it's also about diplomatic changes, about old allies drifting apart and new friendships popping up, like in Latin America. After the 1950s, it was basically a CIA playground. They carried out 34 coup attempts in 12 countries, 34. But this is 2023 and things have changed. Latin America is a lot more confident and assertive. Let me give you some examples. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is currently touring Latin America. His first stop is, was Brazil. Their president, Lula da Silva, has a taste for foreign policy. He hasn't joined Western sanctions against Russia, neither has he sent weapons to Ukraine. But on Monday, he made an interesting statement. Lula blamed the US and Europe for extending the war. Listen to this. Getting peace there is very difficult. President Putin does not take the initiative to stop. Ukrainian President Zelensky does not take the initiative to stop. Europe and the United States contribute to the continuation of this war. The response was swift. Washington accused Lula of parroting Russian and Chinese propaganda. For Lula, it was a big statement to make because Brazil is a major non-NATO ally of the US. Bilateral trade is worth over $100 billion. So Washington's criticism unsettled Lula. The very next day, he condemned the Russian invasion of Ukraine. At the same time, he reiterated his peace offer. So that's one US ally acting a bit shaky. The second is Mexico. Their president is openly accusing the Pentagon of spying. Listen to this. Then we also have to take care of our information for the sake of national security. I made this decision. No, we are now going to safeguard information from the Navy and the Defense Ministry because we are being a target of spying by the Pentagon. Quick context. The Mexican president was talking about the Pentagon leaks. They mentioned military tensions between Mexico's Navy and the U.S. Army. Whatever the reason... The outcome is bad for Washington. Mexico is their largest trading partner in the region. Total trade, more than $600 billion, not to mention the porous border between them. Now, both these examples should raise alarm bells in Washington. They threaten one of the cornerstones of U.S. policy. It's called the Monroe Doctrine. What does this policy say? That the U.S. must have total domination over the Western Hemisphere. No other power should be allowed to enter. The first target of this policy was European powers, but not anymore. The new threat is China and Russia. As always, it's the money that's making the moves. In the year 2000, China's trade with Latin America was $12 billion. Now, $430 billion. It is the region's second largest trading partner overall. And first, in countries like Argentina, Brazil and Venezuela, China is their biggest trading partner. And don't forget the loans. China has lent $140 billion to Latin America. In exchange, they got access to oil. These numbers cannot be dismissed as random. They reflect a change in U.S. attitude. For decades, they took Latin America for granted. All the coups, all the so-called wars on drugs, all the relentless lecturing. Surely it had to backfire at some point. 
So naturally, Latin American nations are exploring their options. Last year, Joe Biden hosted the Summit of Americas. Leaders from Mexico, Cuba and Venezuela did not attend. He got a second embarrassment last month. President Lula of Brazil skipped his summit for democracy. So the message to Washington seems quite clear. This isn't the 1950s anymore. But does that mean Latin America is cozying up to China or Russia? Well, not necessarily. This shift is more about neutrality than picking sides. It's about making the most of the emerging order. An example of that is Argentina. Reports say they're interested in joining the BRICS. It would mess up the acronym, but that's the rumor. Going forward, the Monroe Doctrine is likely to get weaker. America faces a similar challenge in West Asia, but there, U.S. military assistance remains unrivaled. That's not the case in Latin America. Such a shift may not happen overnight, but it's certainly in the works. Have you ever seen a time machine in real life? If not, you could soon get the chance. Just turn on the TV on May 6th. You'll be transported at least three centuries back. You will see a king ride a golden chariot. You will see him wear looted crown jewels. You will see loyal ministers line up inside a huge church. Basically, a whole lot of entitlement. Disclosure time. Time machines do not exist. What I just described could be the coronation of King Charles. It's scheduled for May 6th. Now, if you're wondering how coronations are still a thing, you're not alone. Around 51% of Britons feel the same. They say the UK government should not be funding the coronation. The question is, what is the estimated bill? And turns out there isn't one. The UK government has not revealed what the coronation will cost. Talk about insult to injury. First, you make citizens pay for a 17th century ritual. Then you don't even tell them how much it costs. And the timing could not have been worse. UK's inflation is at 10%. It is the highest in Western Europe and G7. People are struggling to pay their food and power bills. And what does the government do? Splurge on the king. I know the new currency has his face on it, but it doesn't make it any better. While the government has been silent, some independent estimates have emerged. King Charles's coronation could cost anywhere between $60 million to $120 million, and that is taxpayers' money. Money that could have been used to build schools, to hire more teachers or doctors, basically anything but putting a 74-year-old man on a throne. But that's the Great Britain for you. Now, I know a lot of people will say it's Britain's money. They can spend it any way they want, which is true. But maybe ask your own people as well. By all accounts, the coronation will be deeply unpopular. Some of the biggest British stars have refused to perform at the event. Harry Styles said no. Elton John said no. So did Adele, Spice Girls and Robbie Williams. And frankly, it makes sense. Perfect sense. Why would you want to associate with an institution that pioneered slavery and colonialism? And that too in 2023. This brings us to the international reaction to the coronation. A lot of world leaders have accepted the invite. Joe Biden, for one, has been invited. India's President Draupadi Murmu has also been invited. So has Pope Francis. And many of them will attend the ceremony on the 6th of May. But that's not because they love the monarchy. It's basic diplomatic courtesy. But for a moment, think of all those former British colonies, all those communities enslaved, looted and massacred in the crown's name. King Charles is the new face of that institution. And I'm not saying he's an evil person or he was directly involved. But the optics are undeniably cruel. And speaking of optics, another painfully awkward scene awaits us on the 6th of May. Britain's new monarch meeting his Indian origin first minister. You guessed it right, Rishi Sunak. Now some people will call it an example of Britain's inclusiveness. But let's be frank here. As the kids say nowadays, it will be cringe-worthy. The last coronation in Britain was around 70 years ago. Different monarch, different times. Today, we live in the era of political correctness. So why hasn't anyone cancelled the monarchy yet? Think about it on the 6th of May. As you watch King Charles ride a gilded chariot, paid for by taxpayers. As he walks out in fine clothes, paid for by taxpayers. And as he puts on the crown jewels, probably looted from a colony. I guess the British anthem makes sense now. 
Only God can save the king. Now let's turn our attention to Russian President Vladimir Putin. He visited the front lines this week, parts of eastern Ukraine that Russia has taken over. He was seen dressed in a heavy blue jacket, descending from a military helicopter, greeting senior commanders. But was it really Putin? Ukraine says it was a body double. And frankly, this debate is not new. Putin has been at the center of such speculation for a while now. People analyze his ears, his wrinkles, his fingers, and conspiracy theories flood the internet. But then again, Putin is not the only one. Many leaders have been accused of using political decoys. They're individuals with strong physical resemblance to the person they impersonate. Who are these leaders and why do they need a body double? Here's a report. Russian President Vladimir Putin visited the war zone in Ukraine this week. It was his second trip since the war in Ukraine began. So it's a big deal. But for Kyiv, something else is even bigger. They say Putin was never in Ukraine because he was using a body double. And this only renewed such conspiratorial claims because this debate is not new. In fact, only last month, Putin's body double was rumored to appear. Reports say he has an entire team of them. And such claims of Putin using body doubles have surely increased, especially since last February. That's when the war in Ukraine began. But he's not the only leader who's said to have used body doubles. In February, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky was accused too. Apparently, he used a double while meeting US President Joe Biden. Who, by the way, has been accused of this too. People claim he used one while receiving a COVID vaccine. So according to rumors, many leaders use political decoys. The list is long. It includes North Korea's Kim Jong-un, USSR leader Joseph Stalin, the late Queen of Britain, Queen Elizabeth, and even the late Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein. And these conspiracy theories only get wilder. Reports say the political decoys often use plastic surgery. But some things can still give them away. For starters, the height. Then gestures and body language, because they are unique for every person. And then, earlobes. Yes, ears are a good identifier. Here's a fun fact. Since the 1950s, ear measurements have been used by forensic scientists. They can help in identifying suspects of crime. And today, ears have become an even bigger identifier than fingerprints. So experts are now comparing Putin's earlobes across the years. But it's not confirmed if Putin ever used a decoy. Some others haven't been so lucky. Like the former US Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. His political aide said that Kissinger used an impersonator. For most cases, there is no real proof. However, speculation on the matter seems irresistible. These theories continue to enthrall the masses. They correlate with rumors of leader illnesses. Some even say leaders use body doubles to escape capture, like Osama bin Laden and Hitler. But these rumors continue with little to back them up. That being said, it's unclear if body doubles will even be useful in the future. Because this is a time when young ABBA appeared on stage in a holographic avatar. And during an election rally in France last year, Jean-Luc Mélenchon appeared in 11 cities simultaneously, again through a hologram. No, so technology is puissant. clearly moving on. For aspiring Putin doubles, their career prospects may be limited. Now let's talk about the tragedy that just took place in Yemen. More than 80 people died in a stampede in the capital Sana'a last night. More than 300 are injured, some critically so. This happened during a charity event. People had gathered to receive a cash handout. They were being given 5,000 Yemeni rials. That's just about 9 US dollars. But hundreds in the Gulf's poorest nation went to claim the sum. The distributors could not control the crowd and chaos erupted. The visuals from our next report may be disturbing. It should have been a day of joy in Yemen's capital, Sana'a. People were supposed to receive a sum of money as charity. It was a kind act just days before Eid al-Fitr. But tragedy struck the war-torn nation again. A stampede broke out after hundreds gathered to collect the donation. More than 80 people died, more than 300 are injured. Some are in a critical condition. 
the toll may rise further. All this because of poor management at a charity drive. Late last night, some merchants were distributing about 5,000 Yemeni rials to the needy. That's worth about 9 US dollars. It may not sound like much, but it would have helped some of Yemen's poor and needy. Remember, this is a country that has been devastated by war. Even before the conflict started in 2015, it was one of the poorest nations in the Arabian Gulf. Then, the fighting broke out between Iran-backed Houthi rebels and Yemen's Saudi-backed government. It plunged the nation into abject poverty. Now, over half of Yemen's population lives below the poverty line. One in five of Yemen's 31 million people live on less than one dollar a day. So you can understand why so many gathered to receive the charitable donation. But the crowd got too big, and then tragedy struck. Some witnesses say it was crowd control gone wrong that caused the stampede. They say Houthi guards fired in the air to get people to move in an orderly manner. The gunfire accidentally hit an electric wire. The wire exploded, leading to panic. That's what witnesses say caused the stampede. Of course, it's hard to verify this. The Houthi forces that govern Yemen's capital quickly sealed off the area. People, including journalists, were barred from entering the school where the donation drive was taking place. The Houthi regime released their own footage after the event, and officials were shown visiting the injured. They also released some statements. We are firstly checking on the injured and those who died. The Interior and Health Minister, members of the Public Prosecution, the head of the Supreme Judicial Council and all other relevant officials have proceeded with the legal duties to examine this unfortunate event and to find a serious solution for this to never happen again. We are experiencing a great tragedy. A large number of our citizens have died during this stampede. We have taken several measures and hopefully we will reach positive results. Several committees were established, such as high levels of social, health, security and judicial committees. Hopefully things will be okay and the results will be positive. What happened was a big tragedy and the Houthi leadership is keeping a close eye. The Houthi government is conducting an investigation. Two of the charity drive's organizers have been detained. The Houthis say they will pay about $2,000 in compensation to each family that lost a relative. Just $2,000. That's how much a life is valued in Yemen now. While the stampede isn't related to the Yemen war, the war brought this situation about. It forced millions into poverty, left them at the mercy of heavily armed groups. It made their home a battlefield for an Iran-Saudi proxy war. Now that ties have improved between the regional powers, Yemen is forgotten. Its people forced to seek charity just to survive. And this time, it's the charity that killed them. Now to Taiwan. It wants people to learn English and it's ready to spend almost a billion dollars to push for it. The government says it wants to make Taiwan bilingual and it has set a deadline for this, the year 2030. This money, the billion dollars, will be spent over the next five years. Now why do, what do people in Taiwan speak right now? Mostly Mandarin Chinese. And why does Taipei want to switch to English to boost the economy? You see, whether we like it or not, English is the global language of business. One fifth of the world speaks it. So it makes sense to do business in a language that most people understand. Earlier, Taiwan's trade largely depended on China. So they did not really need English. But now with tensions rising, the commerce is also being limited and Taiwan is heavily dependent on trade. Its economy is worth $829 billion. And about a third of this depends on exports. High-tech hardware exports. So promoting a language that facilitates business is essential. It makes sense. Taiwan sees multiple benefits from its switch to English. It will help domestic companies do well abroad. It will attract more foreign investments and tourists, and it will make Taipei more competitive. Who are they competing with? Other Asian economic powers like Hong Kong, Singapore, the Philippines and India. 
all former colonies and all with a large number of English speakers. In fact, Hong Kong is trilingual. They speak English, Mandarin and Cantonese. It's a byproduct of Hong Kong's complicated legacy, but definitely a boon when it comes to business. Then we have Singapore. It got independence in the year 1965 and since then it has promoted English as its main language. Again, this was for economic purposes and the results are evident. Next on our list is the Philippines. It was colonized by the US. After independence in 1946, Manila stuck to English. And then there's India. The story is a bit more complicated here. Only about 10% of India knows English. But considering India's population, it's a pretty big number. India has the second largest English-speaking population in the world. It's a massive market that foreign firms want to tap into. Also a source of English-speaking labor. Although our relationship with English is complicated, and this could be true for all former colonies, English is both a reminder of colonial oppression and a route to upward mobility. The oppression part is obvious, but the language has allowed some, some of us to thrive economically. The go-to example in India is the list of Indian origin CEOs helming US giants, Microsoft Satya Nadella, Google Sundar Pichai, Indra Nui, Ajay Banga, Shantanu Narayan. It's a long list and no matter how good their other skills are, which are obviously good, they wouldn't be there if they did not know how to speak English. Most people and their governments know this. Around the world, countries work on their English language proficiency to attract businesses and investment even countries with no history of British rule. I'll give you an example. At least 85% of the people in all Scandinavian countries speak English. Most mainland European nations have a sizable proportion of English speakers. So Taiwan's policy is not novel in any way. But their timeline, we say, is ambitious. Seven years to teach English to millions of people is unheard of. Even Singapore, with a century and a half of British rule, took decades to make most citizens English speakers. So Taiwan's goal is a tough one to achieve, especially with the dragon breathing fire and threatening war. We wish them luck. Our next story takes me back to a poem. It's by the Soviet poet Boris Slutsky. And this is what it says. It's not even humiliating. In fact, it's rather fun watching our rhymes deflate like foam as greatness retreats solemnly into logarithms. Do you know when this was written? In 1959, he was talking about the defeat of poets at the hands of engineers. And today it seems unintentionally prophetic because robots are coming for your poems, paintings and music. In fact, they're already here. The world of art is living with artificial intelligence or AI. And this week, we heard the future of music. Let's just say, it was scary good. We are talking about Heart on My Sleeve, a song made by AI. It cloned the voices of famous artists, Drake and The Weeknd. But here's the catch. There was no real way to tell that it's a fake. And it sounded like a complete hit. So obviously the song exploded. It garnered millions of views on YouTube, Spotify and other platforms. And now it has been removed. Some are looking at this as a minor nuisance. Others call it harmless mimicry. But for most of us, it points to something more serious. Is AI the harbinger of headaches for the world of music? And also for art in general? Look at this photograph. It's very good. It's also very fake. This is also AI-generated work. It was submitted in a photography contest recently. It won the award, but the artist declined it. He said it would be unfair to do so. I wanted to see if uh, competitions are prepared for AI images to be handed in, and uh, they are not. It's very um, important that they are aware that um, there will be more and more AI-generated images in photo competitions, and it should not be mixed up. But let alone competitions, is the world prepared for AI in art? We are currently at an inflection point. Names like ChatGPT, Bard and Midjourney come to mind. And they have come a long way. It's not just about nerdish fascination anymore. Common people like you and me are using these AI tools. They're creeping into our lives and flooding the internet. Remember when Jay-Z rabbed Shakespeare? Or when the Pope was seen wearing a Balenciaga puffer jacket? 
this is creative and it's good humor, but it's also scary because our fear remains the same. Can AI do a better job than the artists it is imitating? It churns out art faster and its tech is improving. Soon differences between real and AI generated art could become indistinguishable. Experts say using AI is a violation of an artist's creativity and personhood. Lazy artists may use AI and it may even infringe upon livelihoods. So we will say what we've always said. Even if creativity must not be curtailed, AI needs more guardrails in place. And even if policies take their own sweet time, we can relax a little. Because art remains somewhat isolated from artificial intelligence. I find human drawings more appealing, precisely because they are messy. When you see drawings by a traditional artist, sometimes the hand is disproportionately big. But because it is disproportionate, it looks appealing. There is no risk of artists being replaced by artificial intelligence because the creative act is the most human of all acts, which comes from an intention and therefore from consciousness which comes from something that artificial intelligences are very, very far from having at the moment. Think about it. The enjoyment of art is reliant on humanity. We don't love music because it is a digitized accumulation of chords and lyrics. We love it because it comes from a human being. It is inspired by their experiences, their ideas. Like when Rihanna's song said, nobody text me in a crisis, we felt that. Or when Taylor Swift sang about her relationships, a lot of people could relate because we connect with the artist. It's true that AI fakes today are merely a sideshow. There is much more to come. But AI will continue to be a sideshow in the real world of art. We say true genius will beat the algorithm every time. So we agree when, when Slutsky said, it's not even humiliating. In fact, it's rather fun. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story, starting with Ukraine. A mysterious bright flash was seen in the sky over Kiev. We're not sure what this was about, but it has spread confusion and fears of Russian missile attacks in Ukraine's capital. A search operation is on in the Mediterranean to find Tunisian migrants. They went missing after their boat sank. In Argentina, workers as organizations are protesting against poor living conditions and a deal with the IMF. And a rare hybrid solar eclipse was seen over a town in Australia. Finally, what makes April the 20th significant? Taking you back in history on this day, the largest oil spill happened. It took place in the Gulf of Mexico. The year was 2010. There was an explosion in an oil drilling rig called Deepwater Horizon. The blast was triggered by a surge of natural gas that tore through concrete. Around 4 million barrels of oil leaked in the Gulf of Mexico over three months. 11 workers were killed. Needless to say, there was an extensive damage to animals and marine life. Over 82,000 birds, 25,000 marine mammals and tens of thousands of fish were killed. Who was responsible? A US judge said three companies were responsible. But majorly, oil company BP was blamed for making profit-driven decisions. Leaving you with this, thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
too fast, but oh my god. Oh, incredible. and Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict. This year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one, the Kohinoor and the colonial loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting. Becoming a UK PM. Well, it's not like that we are going to get the Kohinoor back. <laughs> <laughs> but at least India is on its way to the top. Huh? But Gautam sir, there's actually not much to celebrate. Why not? An Indian is ruling the UK. Indian leaders in third countries often tend to overcompensate for their minority handicap. Key. For example, Sunak's Home Secretary of Indian origin, Suela Brahman, disapproved of India-UK free trade because it would encourage people immigrating to the UK and the majority of whom were Indians. Structurally, India and UK have passed baggage, but still hasn't been resolved. And that is why... Ladies and gentlemen, India needs to significantly temper its expectations from Rishi Sunak. Presenting Vantage with me, Palki Sharma, a first-of-its-kind global show with an Indian perspective. Mismanaged vaccination drive, broken healthcare systems, citizens taking matters into their own hands. India's failure in managing the COVID-19 crisis is staggering. Want stories but without the West spin on it? Presenting Vantage with me, Palki Sharma, a first-of-its-kind global show with an Indian perspective. <laughs> 